There are many businessmen, I've run into them constantly, who call themselves Christians and attend church and don't even have the guts to pray for their meal when they're out with unbelieving businessmen. Wake up, my friends. We've had many opportunities on that alone just to share the gospel with people. Uh, I was in a restaurant once, big boys out in California, and I was there with five other pastors. And we went at lunchtime to get a hamburger, and there was, the restaurant was just filled with people. It was really crowded. And we sat in a booth, all six of us, a little semicircle, and, and uh, one of the guys across the table said, uh, well, why don't we just pray silently? You know, we don't want to make a problem here. The guy next to me, who knows me real well, tapped me on the arm and said, David, don't do what I think you're going to do, please. <laughs> I was boiling over the remark. So I got up. I know you'll think this is crazy, but I got up and I yelled out the top of my voice, Hey, we're trying to pray here. Could you all be quiet in the restaurant while we have this word of prayer? <laughs> it's the funniest thing. The only thing I wish today is that we had it on video. Everybody, I swear, in a restaurant put their little hands together and bowed their heads. <laughs> it was so funny. And of course, then I knew I had a crowd, so it was a long prayer. <laughs> oh God, we know everybody in this restaurant is a sinner on their way to hell, and that only Jesus can save them from their sin. I went on and on. When I finished, the whole restaurant cheered, gave a clap. And I looked at the table, and those guys were under the table. <laughs> No, but they were embarrassed. <laughs> I don't recommend that tactic, of course, but you know something? We need to say, I belong to the Lord. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation of everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Don't fear man. Don't fear man. The Bible calls the fear of man a snare and a trap. I don't care if it's a relative, it's your mother, your father, your grandparents, or your kids. Don't fear them, ever. You fear the Lord with all your heart. Don't fear him who can kill your body either. Fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. I'm threatened all the time. People are going to blow me away. I just want you to know I'm going to die on time. Not a day earlier, not a day later. I'm under divine appointment for death. The Bible says so. He knows the day I was born and the day I'm going to die, and he knows all the days in between. All of my days are in his heart, and God knows all about me, and I should fear no one on this planet except the Lord God alone. You fear God, my friends. That's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. It's so important. Number five, look at verse 13. In 2 Timothy 3.13, he tells us a fifth thing that will characterize our perilous times. In 2 Timothy 3.13, did you notice what he said? But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You see, the fifth characteristic of perilous times is the presence of widespread deception that will lead the majority of professing believers away from the truth of God's Word. Here's how it happens, folks. They quote a verse or two that's comfortable to them to make you think that they somehow are committed to the Bible. And then they proceed to give their own opinions. Some folks say to me, why do you read so much scripture? And I jokingly say, well, that's the only time I know I'm right. But I was at a men's conference once, over 2,000 men. I was the last speaker in a long day of speakers. And they told us we'd each have an hour. But all the other guys kept taking a little time, you know. So by the end, we were to be out of there by 5 o'clock. They'd started early in the morning. It was now quarter to 5, and I hadn't spoken yet. The, speak the uh, man running the conference turned to me, and he said, David, I I'm sorry, but we've got to be out of here by 5. And he said, I know you read a lot of Scripture, so why don't you, because of time, just skip the reading of God's Word and get into the preaching? I got up to the microphone. I said, I understand we only got a little bit of time, so... I'm going to skip the preaching and just read God's Word. We had scores of men who flooded down the aisle to get right with the Lord. Listen, the Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce to the dividing point of soul and spirit. We need to hear the Word of the living God. People wonder, why are so many kids coming? 
They see all these kids coming, sitting on the floor all over the place, opening their Bibles and listening to me yell and scream at them. Let me tell you something. Kids want to hear it straight. They're tired of all the junk they've been having for so long now. This is no longer the baby boomers' uh, lifestyle. It's a baby boomers' nightmare. And the truth of the matter is the kids who are under that crowd are sick of it. They're sick of it. Tell me the truth. And folks, we need to get back to the Word of God. The deception is everywhere. Remember that Jesus spoke about this and said in those days, there are going to be many false Christs and many false prophets. There's over a thousand guys in India claiming to be the Messiah. It isn't just Reverend Moon or David Koresh or something else that may be in your mind and heart. They're everywhere. People thinking that they're somehow God's gift to this world. In Israel alone, they, you know they have a special psychiatric ward for all the people that go over there. They call it Jerusalem Syndrome. You go over there and you all of a sudden think you're a prophet of God. And you start yelling and screaming at people on the streets and talking like you know what God's going to do. It's a serious problem. And there's all kinds of people who are saying things. I just had a man last week where we were uh, preaching in Arizona, came up and he handed me a whole stack of pages of his direct revelations from Jesus, who showed up in his room and told him exactly what to write. And he sat there and he was sincere about it all. I said, well, Jesus didn't give this to you. He said, he sure did. I said, no, he's not paying any private visits to anybody. He's still at the right hand of the throne of God where he daily intercedes for us. He isn't coming back till he said he's coming back. So he didn't pay you a private visit. And by the way, those aren't prophecies from Jesus. He said, he said how do you know that? I said, because he doesn't misspell words. <laughs> it was the stupidest thing I'd ever read. What is the matter with people? We got all kinds of junk. Uh, my wife and I are watching Christian television. My wife doesn't like me to watch it because she's afraid I'm going to break the TV. But I get mad at they. But I need to watch and see what's going on. This Christian preacher on television, he's talking on a television, you know, and not really saying anything. I call him birdbath. He's so shallow. But anyway, he doesn't really say anything. He doesn't teach the Bible nothing. Then all of a sudden, in the midst of it, he said, Oh, what's that, God? Oh, God, I don't think I can do that right now. Okay, if you say so, the Lord just told me that he wants some folks to send a thousand dollars in. <laughs> Widespread deception. Paul said they'll increase. You better understand it, they're everywhere. It's so bad, I can't believe the guys that are in the pulpit who call themselves teachers of the Word of God. The deception is unbelievable. The other day a guy told me that I'm too legalistic about telling folks how to believe in Jesus. You spend too much time, you make it too hard. He said all you have to do is say, do you believe in Jesus? If they believe in Jesus, that's all that matters. I said, that couldn't be. He said, why is that? Well, because there's 2,000 guys down in Mexico named Jesus and they can't save you. <laughs> he looked at me and said, see what I said? That's your problem. I said, no. The Bible says you must confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. The issue is who he really is. Which Jesus are you talking about? And what is the Bible's record about who he is? He says, oh, I suppose they have to believe in God in order to be saved. Absolutely. If he isn't God Almighty in human flesh, then he can't save anyone in the 20th century. If he's only a perfect man, he can only substitute his life for one other man. That's the law. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. How could he, dying 1900 years ago, save you and me? Only one way if he were God, that his infinite life would equal the sum total of all human life which he himself created. God literally substituted himself on that cross for the whole world, praise God. God was in Christ, said Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.19, reconciling the world unto himself. John said, this is the true God, 1 John 5.21.